in the interest of saving it for the damn show, what do you say as soon as this fucking app opens? God damn it. I, need to, I, I just need to pay for this stupid app. Um, in the interest of saving it for the show, what do you say we just go ahead and start the goddamn show? Hello and welcome to the Ritual Misery Podcast, episode 161 for Thursday, the 8th of February, 2018. This is actually the 8th of February? I guess so. Uh, this is a show where two lifelong friends and their guests celebrate all things geek. I'm Amos. I have Kent on the uh, shoot. If you're listening to this, not watching it, it's in the center channel right next to me. And if you're watching it, it's probably penetrating your right eyeball a little bit harder than your left. That's Kent over there uh, killing your uh, your cones and rods. How you doing, man? Oh, my God. I've, I've never been told that I'm penetrating anyone. Uh, uh, that's... that's uh, that's cool. That's what she said. Um, especially an eye hole. Um, uh, I've never penetrated an eye hole before. Rods and cones, man. You're killing the rods and the cones. <laughs> um, hey, man, we have a guest tonight, man. Why don't you get to introducing them? Because, like, that's your job. Uh, yeah, man. We've got Brian Cofford. Am I saying the last name correctly? No, yeah, you're saying it phonetically correctly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so how, Brian, how would you it's say your last name? Smith. Uh, <laughs> Coford, all right. So Brian yep. Coford, a member of Diamond Club, is with us, and we're gonna get into uh, what he, like, why he is so endeared to us later on in in the program. Me uh, more than now. You. All you need to know is he's Diamond Club. Me more than you. What's up, Brian? Oh, uh, just I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, uh, we I was ta- talking during the pre-show. I was mentioning Brian's gate because uh, I thought he was using a, 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 a sound gate. Um, I got to tell you, dude, I am, after talking to my wife and talking to a few other people and sending out a few emails and, and, and a couple of chats that you and I have had and a, and a little help from, uh, from our friend, uh, Jackie Hearn, I've made the decision to jump ship. I am going to freelance on the podcast editing production and all that kind of stuff starting immediately. I'm already in talks with, uh, uh, the first client. Of course, I'm going to start out for free just to make sure that I, I, have my chops underneath me and then I'm uh, going to go from there. And that is going to be my fucking career. When I, when I graduate this military service, I'm going for it, like diving in, making it happen. Fuck you. Hey, Special. that's dude. That is freaking <laughs> awesome. Um, I, I might be able to kick you some, some work if it's for free. Uh, it's only going to be for free until I've proven my chops. Like, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> like I get this show, it's called ritual misery. Oh. Um, you Looking see, for somebody to replace our current, current editor. <laughs> I see how it is, asshole. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, man, it's been a, this week has been a a lot of inspiration, a lot of talks with some good people, and uh, I mean, you you know where my mind's been for a while now with the uh, the talks yeah. that we've had, and I mean, like I've got a year to get my shit together and figure out what the hell I want to do with my life when I graduate the Air Force. So I'm gonna yeah. go ahead and start that shit now and just dive in because of. If I don't do it now, I'll never fucking do it. So, well, congratulations, man. That is awesome. The, one of the biggest challenges that I've had in my life is figuring out what I want to be when I grow up. And it sounds like you figured it out. That's that's badass. Yeah. Brian, when you were a kid, what did you want to be when when you grew up? Uh, I wanted to. Lego employs people to build things out mm-hmm. of Legos for like their, uh, you know, their uh, amusement parks and things like that. And yeah. Uh, I used to think that would be a neat job. Mm. Hell yeah, I and, still think uh, that would be an awesome job. Did you did you achieve yeah. that? Are you a Lego builder? Mm, no. Not I just have no. lots of Legos <laughs> that are in Arizona, nowhere near me. Yeah, <laughs> that, I mean, that's it's like it's like the Air Force. That's where all the parts are. It's in some desert in Arizona or some shit. Um, yeah, I actually I actually drug all those Legos with me to Edwards uh and, and used them a lot when I was there. But after I left Edwards, I sort of didn't make it with it with me to sh- Chicago. So so you and I have something in common then. We've both lived in the Antelope Valley. Yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> I spent most of my childhood there. It was either Indiana or Antelope Valley. So uh, between Palmdale, Lancaster, and uh, Green Valley. Um, yeah, the whole area. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I grew to love and hate it. Yeah, it was interesting when they started trying to turn Mojave into a spaceport. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you don't know, California is a strange place, and it's full of miniature strange places within it. 
and the Antelope Valley is its own level of strange and its own brand of strange. So if you ever get the chance to go through Palmdale, Lancaster, Quartz Hill, any of that area, skip it. I think yes. there's only one thing that everyone universally knows about California, and that's that it's weird. <laughs> Um, so. yeah, so, so California, so you grew up in California, I, I take it, or, or you moved, actually you moved there, um, yeah. as part of your Air Force career. Yeah, I, I grew up in Colorado. Uh, I was actually born in Utah and grew up in Colorado. And, uh, when I joined the Air Force, of course, they sent me out to California. Mm -hmm. It's funny when you join the military, they, uh, they have you pick which bases you want to go be assigned to, but they also give you the option to pick regions to be assigned to. Mm -hmm. So I picked all of the bases in Colorado and Arizona and all that. And then I had choices left over. So I just picked the whole Southwest. And mm. so they went with that and to, sent me to California instead. To a practical remote location in Southern California. Yeah. yeah so, point I, so in the Air Force, the, Brian was referring to what we, we call the dream sheet, where you, basically you <laughs> put the, uh, you, you, you list your preferences for where you want to be stationed. And uh, I'm I'm convinced that the Air Force uses that list to send you places you don't want to go. Mm. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. Yeah. Because I chose uh, a bunch of overseas places, Alaska, and um, some some bases near Indiana that I knew I didn't have a chance to get, and they sent me to South Carolina. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's close. I mean, it's on the same planet, right? Appreciate that. Um. Um, yeah. So Amos, speaking of air force, you're still active duty air force. Uh, how's, how's that? How was that treating you this that week? That is why I drink. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, no man, but what's, what's been going on this week? What's, what's going on in your I, life? Um, uh, I, uh, mm. so as far as the air force goes, uh, there, there's this thing called TRICARE that we have to go through to get our medical stuff done. And the TRICARE system went through a shit storm in December, so they're still trying to catch up to it. So I'm supposed to be going to physical therapy, and I've been chasing them down, calling and everything else. And it's at the point now where, like, this person in this office over here needs to log in their computer and push this button right here, and they just haven't done it yet. So I'm still not going to fucking physical therapy. Uh, and it's really pissing me off because, well, I, I've been told I, I'm not allowed to work out until I go to physical therapy. But my my body strength is too too weak. Like my core is too weak from all the back surgeries for me to do like the basic functions around the house. So I'm basically just worthless. So thus I sit at the computer until I can't tolerate it no more, and I go lay down. Um, that, however, has led me to a lot of time sitting here watching YouTube, and I've already talked about some of the inspiration I've, I've gone through this week. Um, and I've cut my damn Facebook out. Like I'm off off the Facebook crack. The face crack needs to go the hell away. I'm fully convinced by reading multiple sources and a few studies that if you're on Facebook and using it as a social platform for anything other than like communicating with people that you actually know, uh, you're doing it wrong because it's, 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 it's bad. It's a poison and it needs to go away. Yeah. I, uh, I, yeah, yeah. I've kind of felt that way for a while. I used to use it quite a bit mm. years ago and um, now it's just, you know, if, if someone tags me in something or, like I want to find out, like you know, how my cousin is doing or something like that. I'll, I'll maybe hop on, but yeah. yeah, like using it as a as a like regular social platform, like the way I use Twitter. Yeah, it's been quite a while. Brian, what about you? Are you are you a Facebook guy? Uh, I'm on my third account because I tried to cancel my last two ones, which it's really hard to cancel a Facebook account. I don't know if you've noticed this, yeah. and my current one, uh, the name on it is Aiden McKay. Oh, yeah, a totally real person. Yeah, totally uh, real person. That, uh, and I only yeah. use it because the uh, the tap room I go to insists on putting things there. Uh, and so that's the uh, only reason I even have an account right now. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, I wouldn't use it at all. It's yeah. just garbage. I would say that I use mine more for playing pool with Jotmon and um, keeping up with Current Geek, because or not Current Geek, but um, Gunna Geek, because the Gunna Geek Network, they channel all their stuff through their Facebook page. So that's, that's pretty much what I use Facebook for right now is a birthday reminder, uh, playing, yeah. playing games and, uh, keeping track of going to geek. And that's it. That, you know, that's a good point. It, 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 the birthday reminder is really, that's, that's kind of the, the thing that is, that is like the number one use case for me. Yeah. 
Like my mom's birthday was yesterday. I remembered it, and then Facebook reminded me four times. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Man, so speaking of uh, Air Force stuff, I the Air Force sent me on a trip this week to San Antonio. Uh, I'm I'm no longer active duty Air Force, but I do work for the Air Force now as a civilian. And uh, they figured that I needed to go to San Antonio for some meetings, mm. and uh, that's that's where I spent the first half of my week. And which you know the meetings are you know the meetings are meetings, but I did something I haven't done in over two decades, and that was go to the Riverwalk in San Antonio mm. and play cloak and dagger. Man, I dude, I had such a good time. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to explain that reference here in a second. Uh, but yeah, I had such a good time, man. The first time I went there was, and in fact, the only time I'd been there previously was right after my basic training graduation. Mm -hmm. And my, I went there with my family. I'm dressed in my blues. I'm 18 years old. Like, I mean, what do you get? Like, you're trying to be all proper and, you know, you sit down and eat some food and hope to God you don't get it on your nice uniform. And uh, no, this time I went down there having a blast. Uh, ate some food with with my coworkers, and then we went out and had a few drinks, and it was it was such a good time. And the River Walk is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, Brian, do you did you go down to the River Walk after graduating basic? I, I got near it. Uh, <laughs> I'm not much of a tourist, and so yeah, for my day pass, it was sort of uh, my family uh, wasn't even in the area at the time, and so I just hung out with the other people who had no family to go hang out with. Uh, and we got near downtown San Antonio. I believe I saw the river walk. I could see where the river was, but I never actually went down on it. Yeah. So. If, if you ever find yourself in San Antonio for whatever reason, I definitely recommend going there because I, I actually thought about not going, uh, because I'd like, I was in San Antonio just a little over a year ago and it didn't even enter my mind to go. And when someone suggested it, I was like, yeah, I've kind of, been there like i've been to the the alamo as well i have no desire to go back like it was mm -hmm. cool to see it you know check the box but um no but i'm really glad that i went uh one of my coworkers, i don't want to say insisted but like heavily uh you know vouched for the idea of going heavily down there and i was like idea. yeah let's do it um What's so, that? so the whole thing about cloak and dagger is the yeah. movie cloak and dagger Remember the right. movie yeah, Cloak yeah. and Dagger where they, they, they had yeah. the Yeah, wasn't it like uh, secret, Dabney Coleman, uh, I think? The, the secret SR-71 plans were on a on a oh, yeah. essentially a floppy disk, but it was like... The <laughs> side, it, it, oh, anyway, um, yeah, and, and like the, the my two dad's dad, or, or I don't know, it was one of those guys, uh, uh, somebody, he was in the movie and everything else, and um, the end scene where they're doing the final chase was set, was the, where, where they filmed that was the Riverwalk. Okay. Yeah, I haven't seen that movie in like 30 years, probably. Right. But it still sits in this stupid information nugget up here. So every time I think of the Riverwalk, that's what I think of is, yeah. give it to me, son. Yeah, it's... <laughs> and that's well, not even okay. the porn version. That's the, that's the actual TV version. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I vaguely recall that movie. Yeah. Uh, I, well, I watched that when... When my Goonies tape broke and we had to wait for it to come back on HBO to re-record, uh, I watched the Cloak and Dagger tape. So, Oh, good old VHS. <laughs> yeah, the one, the one I had a problem with was uh, the Shawshank Redemption because they showed it on TNT like 20 times a week. Mm. And so I'd be flipping through channels and it, that would be on. And so I bought the DVD so I didn't feel like I had to watch the rest of it every time I came across it. And you still do. <laughs> Actually, Probably, no, yeah. it worked pretty good. Oh, nice. is also, not having cable anymore helps as well. Mm. Oh, so that's another thing. Um, we 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 we've, we've been hooked up with the uh, the cable channels on the on the Apple TV. You know, the little like verification thing. Oh, uh, sure. So you know, it, it, the, the, my TV was magically verified uh, by means other than myself. I have no idea how it happened, but my TV is now magically verified with all kinds of channels that my mother-in-law might be getting um, on her cable subscription. Oh, so yeah, um, so we're, we, we, I was going through the living room the other day and I heard commercials. And I was like, what the hell is this? <laughs> so I sat there and I watched like an entire set of commercials. Like it was such a novelty to me because it's been, it's been years since I watched commercials. Um, 
and then immediately like walked away. And then we watched the Super Bowl on the normal antenna because the stream wouldn't work. It, mm. Yeah, it was, it was so weird. What, what did you? Well, how did you try to watch it? Amos, the NBC, how did you try to watch the Super Bowl? NBC Sports app. Ah. Uh. Yeah, and it, well, it, it was coming in, but then like the commercials would get bleeped out like halfway through, and I was like, "This is stupid." So I just went to the antenna to see if it'd work, and that's like the only channel we actually get out here. So, yeah, see, on for me, like the first set of commercials was it like uh, you know, no commercials. It basically just said, "We will will return to our broadcast soon," right. or something like that. And then I, the second set of commercials, I think, was like the first half of it was like that, and then like maybe a break here and there throughout, but I got the vast majority of the commercials. Mm. Yeah. We just watched the antenna version and it was fine. Yeah. Like, yeah. Brian, did you watch said, the only channel we get? Did, yeah. Did you watch I, uh, I, I found that uh, watching the magicians on Netflix isn't a very good way to watch the Super Bowl. Fair enough. Ah, fair ah, enough. Yeah. That's a, that's an interesting discovery. I, who would have yeah. thought? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I think it's been hypothesized before, but I'm glad you, glad that you went through the, the experimentation to, to make sure. <laughs> Yeah, just had to be sure. Yeah. yeah, for science. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, this is actually one of the uh, the the best Super Bowls I've seen in a long time. Like it was it was fun to watch. Uh, I'm always in favor of a Brady meltdown uh, on off the <laughs> on or off the field. Um, uh, driving a car in in major rush hour traffic, I'm fine with him breaking down at that point too. Um, it, it's just it was it was a good one to watch. I enjoyed it. Yeah, it's always interesting to me to to hear all of the the like you know Brady hate or uh, Philadelphia Philadelphia hate or whatever like the the strong oh my god strong opinions about this. Mm. And I'm just like you know what I just want a good game mm. and we got that dude. Like I was yeah. I I didn't have a dog in a fight. Like I don't care for New England or Philadelphia. Just don't care. Mm. Um, uh, oh, and also the teams that play there. Yeah. I don't care for those either. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the entire New uh, no, England region, just, yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. I, you know, I just, I don't know. No opinion, really. I just don't care. They're fine. They're whatever. I don't care. Yeah. But they they played a good game on both sides of that. I thought the refs actually uh, were fair. For the most part, yeah. I didn't, I didn't see um, any major bad calls. Yeah, and w the one thing that annoyed me, though, is the announcer... Well, one of the announcers, and I don't know their names well enough uh, to say which one was which, but one of them was playing antagonist, like mm. questioning refs calls and stuff like that. And I'm like, dude, why don't you shut up? Like, it's very obvious that they made the correct call. You've watched yeah. the replay 74 times, and yep. it's very obviously the right call. But you're sitting there, oh, I don't know, man. I think that's probably the wrong call by the referees. What are they doing out there? I'm like, yeah. Whatever, dude. Yeah, uh, but but the, the, oh, go, ahead, the, go ahead, go ahead. The go NFL ahead. actually does the calls the right way. I think you got the team on the field, and and they're they can be punished for making the wrong calls. Um, and then anything that's up in the air doesn't get reviewed there, like scoring plays stuff like that. It all gets reviewed at a central office in New York by like the core group of referees, and yep. I believe they don't get to see like the scores and stuff. They just see the play. They don't see any of the overlays, and they don't get to keep track of who's winning what games or anything else. So they just see that play and they don't see anything led up to it or anything else. Um, so I think the, the NFL is probably the only one, only, only professional sport that really takes it to the next level and does replays correctly uh, or reviews mm -hmm. correctly. But that could all just be a fabrication from a dream that I had like two years ago when I was watching the game and fell asleep. So <laughs> uh, that's take what, however big the grain of salt you need to take that with, you know, go ahead and slide that down to yeah, so so one of the things that happened during during the game, actually during a commercial break of the game, is that they announced. Uh, well, Netflix had a commercial announcing the third movie in the Cloverfield series, mm -hmm. and not only did they announce that the movie was coming out soon, they announced that it was happening immediately after the game and it was going to be available on Netflix. Yep, uh, I knew that a third Cloverfield movie was in the works. Mm -hmm. But the last I had heard, it was going to be a, a theater release, like in the springtime or maybe the summer, something like that. And then Netflix was like, nope, we got it. And it's available like immediately after the game. So Lucas and I watched this movie. Um, uh, did any, did either of you watch the Cloverfield? I, 
So I haven't finished listening to the episodes of the Film Zone that you've recorded with Lucas because I'm still on this episode. So I haven't <laughs> seen any of the Cloverfield movies, so I couldn't finish the episode on 10 Cloverfield Lane, so I haven't finished the rest of the recordings of the Film Zone. That's that's where I'm at Got with it. Cloverfield. Like, it's my my, in a, my my lack of desire to watch this these films for whatever reason or lack of making time for it is actually stopping other things that I enjoy. Like that's where I'm at with Cloverfield. Brent, what about you, man? Are you, are you a Cloverfield guy? Have you watched these movies? Yeah. So the original one that came out, I, I'm not a huge fan of the found footage stuff. So I had no sure. interest in seeing the first one. Uh, and I didn't hear much about it. So I really don't know what happened in another one. I picked up since then from the other two, uh, 10 Cloverfield Lane, I watched the movies with Mikey, uh, mm. which uh, is is a very good episode of Movies with Mikey, and it covers a fair amount of the plot in that. So I never actually watched the movie, but I get a general idea what that's about. And uh, I did watch uh, the Cloverfield Paradox tonight when I saw in the show notes that you had it listed there so that I could at least talk about that. Yeah, what so. Was, so what was your feel? Did you enjoy the movie? <sighs> It's not the kind of movie I would normally watch. Uh, it it reminds me a lot of Event Horizon. I don't know if you ever saw that movie. Uh, yeah, quite a while ago, I did. See, yeah, and I can see the parallels there. Um, yeah, man, I don't, I don't know, I, I don't know how to feel about this movie. It's weird, and it's like as a standalone. Okay, so if you were to take it as a standalone movie not knowing anything about Cloverfield at all. This movie makes no sense. It yeah. like there, if you have no context for uh, like the other events, this movie makes no sense. So I should it's watch kind this of a, one first is what you're saying. Uh, <laughs> you know, just to test that theory. I go ahead. Yeah. You know what? Do it. Do it. Uh, uh, the thing about, so it, it, it can't real quick, uh, real quick. Jackie Hearn is rating this with about four people. So thank you to Jackie Hearn. Oh, Hey, thank you, Jackie. And thank you for all, you know, all of the, the Raiders that came along. That's uh that's really cool. Thank you. Um, yeah. So 10 Cloverfield lane. If you're, to, if you're just to watch that by itself in a vacuum, I think that movie works. Uh, it works for a lot of reasons. One, like it's a, it's a self-contained plot. Yes. It, it's referential to, the first movie, but I would say barely like there's tie-ins that will add to the context, especially at the end of the movie where you kind of figure out more of what's going on. It kind of relates back to the first movie, mm. which is cool, but you don't have to have any of that knowledge for the mm. movie to work. It's a very strong, uh, strongly written movie. The plot is very tight. The acting is, and the writing is just through the road. Like it is fantastic. I, guess we'll I think you'll enjoy that movie just on its own merits. This movie, I don't know, man. It, it's like they, it's like they ran out of time in the writing room, and they're like, no, fuck it, just uh, you know, no more revisions. Let's just go film this thing. Well, I heard that they were actually filming, like starting the filming before the writing was finished. Well, that's yeah, that's. It feels very much like that. I, <laughs> I uh, no man. I don't know how to feel about it. It's it's um it's it's interesting. It's worth talking about, I guess. If you like, after you watch the movie, like so after Lucas and I finished watching it, you know, we talked for probably a good twenty minutes about it, and you know, and it's kind of cool to pick up, you know, some of the maybe Easter eggs or whatever, and how it ties in with everything else, and maybe where it fits in the timeline and stuff like that. Like that's a worthy conversation, I guess. But it's it's kind of forgettable. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's part of the reason I was equating it to event horizon is because when I first watched event horizon, I found a lot of the stuff that happens in the movie to be exceptionally random. It's just yeah. there just to be there and doesn't really tie together very well. And that was sort of the impression I was getting with this other than the bits that they tied into the other movies. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Also, also for the first bit of the movie, I kept shouting at the screen. Have you tried turning it off and on again? <laughs> that's a very that's a very f15 maintainer thing to say well um it's because uh it's because uh the one actor from uh the it crowd was in it and that's what they say a lot in that mm -hmm. tv show um, uh, is, is that the is that the dude with the beard in, yes. in the movie 
Okay, got it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'll, I'll have to watch this one just to see how it goes, and then we'll, we'll see if I'm, uh, if I'm more or less likely to watch the other Cloverfield movies after watching this one. That'll be the, uh, the, the, the bar. That'll be the, the temp sensor right there. That if, if I, if I'm more likely to watch it, then it was a success, and if I'm not, then it was a failure, and I'm not going to be any worse off. Yeah. So Amos, Super Bowl commercials. What's, what stood out? To you, um, so this was this was a commercial that I saw during the Super Bowl, but I had actually seen it the morning prior or the morning of before the Super Bowl, and had already like shared it out because I thought it was the most amazing damn thing ever, uh, like ridiculously fun and so cool. Um, it is Peter Dinklage and Morgan Freeman. In this this advertisement for Doritos in in Mountain Dew, and oh my god, oh and don't forget Buster Rhymes and uh, Missy Elliott, and oh my god, so good, so fun. This was because it's got Peter Dinklage like like he's lip syncing Buster Rhymes, and he goes through this whole thing of this of this Chris Brown song, you know, um, and then it cuts to Morgan Freeman, and he starts going with Missy Elliott. And it, it, it it's just it's just fun. It's so damn fun. Oh, I love this man. Yeah, it's it's, <laughs> it's interesting to see those voices coming from those actors because it's neither one of them sound anything like that. Right. Yeah. Uh, so it's yeah. It, you're right. It it was fun. I liked it. Yeah, um, I, I saw a teaser for that where they had to, and I hadn't watched the actual commercial until just now. And yeah, that's <laughs> that's just crazy. Uh, Peter Dinklage doing the Buster Rhymes thing is just hilarious. Yeah, and of course, it got busted in a picture like you know doing doing the hype man stuff, and then during the Morgan Freeman part, it's got uh, Missy Elliott in a picture doing the hype hype man stuff. So it's it's really <laughs> just it's fun. It's really interesting and well done, and I enjoyed the hell out of it. It didn't make me more likely to buy Doritos or Mountain Dew because I already love both of those. So <laughs> it was kind of just a win for me. It was like didn't need didn't need the advertisement part was lame. I just enjoyed the the lip syncing. Yeah, I think ads like that very seldom make me want to buy their products. Like like for example, one of my favorite companies to make commercials is Budweiser. Like Anheuser Busch makes some of the greatest ads of all time. Like second probably to Geico. Right. But no, but I am not consuming their product. Like no. there's nothing that's going to <laughs> convince me that their product you, is good. You know how to get me to stop drinking a beer that I probably didn't like in the first place? Have ABM Bev buy it and I will, <laughs> I'm not, I'm done. Yeah. I'm out. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, re I really like the Old Spice commercials, but I still don't buy Old Spice. Yeah. And in fact, that yeah. was one of the, one of the things that came on because the Tide guy came on and was making spoofs and parodies of all these other commercials throughout history and yeah. the, uh, one of them was that? Yeah, one of the twins came down, and she was like, "They're still doing that Old Spice commercial." Wait, <laughs> wait, what's going on? <laughs> what's going on right now? And then she kept talking, and I was like, "Shut up! I'm trying to watch the commercial." Like, you can come in and interrupt the game. You don't come in and interrupt the commercials. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, overall, it was, it was fun. Uh, the Super Bowl was fun. I enjoyed it. My wife watched with me because her dad's team is the Eagles, and so she had. Is one of the few football games she actually had a, a vested interest in, um, and then of course I am uh, anti Brady just because I, out of all the jerks in football, I think he's like the the worst one, um, and uh, yeah, I, I really wanted to see Minnesota play in their home stadium. I was really hoping for that because that'd been the first time in in Super Bowl history. So that was once once Minnesota Minnesota lost out, I was like, ah, okay, well, whatever. Um, but I still enjoyed it. It was fun. Yeah. Good times. Um, I, I'm not saying you missed out on anything, though, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was definitely a football game. Like, it wasn't like a magical experience to convert people over to watching NFL games. It was definitely football. Um, it was just one of the best football games that I'd seen in, in quite a while. So, yeah, I, was gonna say, that, I, I, I did mention that I grew up in Colorado. And, right. Uh, we, the Broncos had some interesting luck with that. Yeah. Uh, the first first game that I ever watched in total was the Niners kicking the shit out of the Broncos in 91. So, uh, you know, there's that. <laughs> wow. 
Was it 91 or 89? Uh, whatever. It beat the uh, shit yeah, out of me either way. It was a while ago. <laughs> so, so Brian missed the Super Bowl. Uh, something that I missed watching live this week was the Falcon Heavy launch. Oh, my God. Uh, it, it was, were you able to watch this? Live? I, you know, I forgot about it that morning. I was playing division and my, my normal morning routine now is to wake up, say hi to everybody, play the division for a little while, then come down, do DTNS, then kind of like get my day going, you know? Um, and this happened, it, it, the, the live webcast ended right before DTNS started. And that's when I was reminded about it. And I was like, son of a bitch. So as soon as DTNS was over, I jumped over and watched this in total. The, I've watched, I've watched the unedited version. I've watched the since published fully edited, cleaned up version. Um, I was entranced. I love this. This is amazing. I'm getting more hyped about, about space than I've ever been in my life. And I feel like a giddy child for it. Yeah, that's man. So this is all. So I knew I, I've known for a while that that SpaceX was going to launch the Falcon Heavy, which of course is the most powerful rocket that we currently have, like anywhere on the planet. Uh, the only rocket that has ever been more powerful was the Saturn V, and we haven't launched that since the '70s, like 1973 or something, was the last time that that uh, uh, Saturn V has launched. So this thing is like. It's an amazing rocket, uh, not just in its capability, like its thrust power, its uh, cargo capability and stuff like that. Uh, but it's ma it's amazing for a few other reasons, uh, not the least of which a private company launched this, that, right. not NASA. Uh, SpaceX, like Elon Musk is, okay, so first of all, Elon Musk is Tony Stark. Like, is he not? Like, would <laughs> anyone on the planet be surprised if he starts flying around in a rocket suit and, like, blowing up bad guys? Like, well, he, would anyone be surprised? He's Tony Stark without all the attitude. Like, he's he seems like a genuinely nice dude. <sighs> yeah. Like, I like mean, every a interview ever. Yeah, well, well, of course. I mean, you, you don't get to be as rich as he is and, you know, shooting cars to space if you're not eccentric. But he's still nice about it, you know? Yeah. All right, so not only was this, you know, a, a civilian company, just a private company uh, doing this, um, but also, and we've seen this in the past, but never from, from such a high-profile event, his rockets can land themselves. Yes, the side boosters did. They, they turned around. It showed the whole process. They turned around. They flew back to almost back to the same place they started to two uh, landing pads. They landed almost simultaneously. It, mm -hmm. That was absolutely ridiculously cool. Oh. Yeah, some, yeah, absolutely unreal. So, something that NASA was never able to accomplish. Uh, no other country was able to accomplish it. In fact, most people thought that it was impossible. Right here it is. Uh, I'm showing it right now. This is the landing itself, and you can see it, there the two side boosters are actually coming down and landing nearly simultaneously on their their launch pads back to back at the place where they took off from. Yeah, it, this is science fiction, cool. dude. Like, we are living so far in the freaking future that, that science fiction is now real. Yep. Uh, and, and also, if you play Kerbal Space, you know that uh, trying to use 27 engines at the same time is not always easy. <laughs> right. Well, I, I, don't, I play, uh, uh, what is this, uh, Simple Physics or simple, simple Rocket, and I can never get, like, my two side rockets to take off at the same time. Like, it's... <laughs> It's kind of ridiculous, but yeah, 27 engines. Uh, in total, the rocket was um, a magnitude of two more uh, 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 times as, or well, it was uh, stronger than the most powerful rocket we've ever successfully launched by a factor of two. Um, so that's like uh, Saturn V times a Saturn V. Um, and, and this is it's just stupid. A million pounds of thrust just from the side boosters. Uh, God, man, so cool, just so cool. I'm just, I'm so in love with this whole thing right now. Yeah, and and to top it off, Mister Mister Eccentric Elon Musk uh, wasn't happy with just like throwing a rocket up into space to to test out his new rocket. Um, he had to do something pretty splashy. Um, Brian, have you, have you been following this? Do you do you know what I'm talking about? What he sent up into space? Yeah, he sent his car up into space. A Tesla Roadster. Yeah. Who the fuck does that? 
Uh, it's also funny that they put uh, a mannequin in a spacesuit in it, so it looks like there's somebody driving through space. I saw somebody yeah. uh, mention that they were they may have been trying to rip off heavy metal. Uh, the, if you look at it from the right angle, it does kind of look like that. Uh, but this is actually this is functional. The spacesuit that they put on the mannequin to put up there is the actual prototype for the spacesuits they plan to use. Um, so this is also a test of the spacesuit itself and its durability. <laughs> and, and then of course it's got don't panic on the dash. It's I, I like, if you are a geek or a nerd or even consider yourself halfway into uh, a, a geek culture, man, and you're not just absolutely jazzed. If your geek boner, isn't just rock hard on this, Dude, you are, like, this is check your pulse. This is porn to me. Like this is, <laughs> this is my jam right here. Yeah. This is like, so when I was cool. A kid, like, Amos, this is no surprise to you. Like when I was a kid, like my ambition, the the, the whole the question of what do you want to be when you grow up, it was always astronaut. Like it was the inspiration, the original inspiration for joining the Air Force. Actually, was mm. like my path to becoming an astronaut. Obviously, that didn't pan out exactly. Yeah, that's not uh, how that not works. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, like so cool, man. Like I'm, I'm so jazzed. I'm, I'm with you, Amos. This is. Uh, this this is nuts. This is this is amazing for all geeks. Yep. Uh, Brian, how do you feel about the, about a Tesla being uh, shot out to the the Kuiper Belt and uh, just you know on this elliptical orbit with uh, Earth, Mars, and whatever asteroid it decides to stop off and fuel up on? Uh, I mean, from a technical perspective, it's it's neat that you can get something that heavy that far out. It does does definitely show uh, how much uh, power they can shove into that rocket. On the other hand, it's an interesting marketing decision. Mm. Look, we do rockets. Look, we do cars. We yeah. do everything. Well, the thing the thing with this was, you know, they couldn't send a a payload up because it's a it's a test flight. So yeah. they didn't so, want, they didn't want to yeah. risk, you know, a, a twenty million dollar, you know, mistake. Um, yeah. but if you're gonna just put a load on there, if you're just gonna put a a a, a big rock of concrete in there, you might as well do something fun with it that's gonna get a lot of attention mm -hmm. and you know, keep the program alive even after, you know, cause it's, it's currently just orbiting kind of fading away from earth right now. It's just, there's a live stream of it. You can watch it just fade away. Yeah. Musk actually tweeted earlier today that the, the, um, trajectory is off from what they had originally planned. So they originally, it was going to orbit Mars a little bit yep, and then yep. shoot out into the belt. Well, when the third, uh, like rocket fire occurred, it like, it was too successful, I guess. And he's, they're basically <laughs> going to overshoot the orbit of Mars. So he's going to go straight to the belt. Mm. Um, one thing that I don't know, and, and uh, I'd really like to find out, um, cause the dashboard says don't panic, but did they pack a towel? Uh, Ooh. There better be a towel in that car. I'm just saying, like something. <laughs> I mean, other, box into I mean the otherwise, seat. Starman is in trouble, dude. He, seriously, if he did not take his towel, he's in trouble. <laughs> um, hey, uh, that, that's uh, that's that's all fun and dandy. Uh, Kent, you you decided you wanted to run some numbers this week and found a little site that had some some cool stuff. Dude, okay, have you guys seen the John Wick movies? Yes. 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 All right. So I was behind, like I was, uh, this was like a, a hole in my movie watching cred, I guess. Everybody oh. and their brother has seen John Wick and talks about how fantastic it is. And I was like, what the fuck is John Wick? Somehow it just flew under my radar. So Lucas and I decided, all right, you know what? We're going to fix this. We're going to watch both John Wicks mm. this weekend. Not a poor choice. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And dude, Good. holy shit. Like everyone's correct. John Wick is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Think about it. Like he kills so many fucking people. Like it's unreal. It's like video game style. Mm -hmm. So I was like, all right, I got to know. And this is after watching the first one. I was like, I, I, I got to know how many people did he actually kill? So, you know, what do you do? You Google it. Mm -hmm. How many people did John Wick kill? Or I think I actually Googled John Wick body count. And one of the first results from Google was this site called visu.info. So V I S U dot I N F O where there's this geek, uh, George, George Hatzis or something like that. Yep. He puts together these visual charts for all kinds of geeky stuff. 
movies and TV shows and things and just like it creates visual charts. And he's got both John Wick movies, not only with his kill count alone, but how but weapons he used, what parts of the body he he killed the people like if it was a headshot or a neck shot or a you know whatever it is like just breaks it down completely and uh, something that I had suspected was was pretty much confirmed by uh, looking at the chart for the second movie his body count basically doubles in John Wick two like uh, he kills most as many or almost twice as many people as he killed in the first one that's not correct. It's 77 to 302, so he quadruples the number of bodies in the second <laughs> movie. Wait, 302? I <laughs> yeah. thought it was like 128. I'm looking at it right now, 77, and then I uh, looked at the other one just a second ago, and it was 302. So, 302. Wow. Lord, man. I thought it was... Mm. Oh, no, oh, the shots no, fired shot's 302. Fire. Kills 128. Yeah, okay, you're right. Oh, yeah. okay. Um, so... But it's still insane, and I highly suggest everybody to go check this site out, vizu.info, V-I-S-U dot info. This, these movies, uh, the, the, the John Wick movies, the first one, basically, they killed his dog, and he went on a rampage. The second one, they stole his car, and he goes on a rampage. Well, he stole, the, stole his car again. Anyway, um, uh, <laughs> this is Keanu in like his perfect role. It's, it's not a stupid role. You, like, you couldn't just get a... a, a Dolph Lundgren in there to just shoot people and it'd be a good movie. Like there's a certain amount of acting uh, finesse that goes into the John Wick role that Keanu Reeves pulls off perfectly, you know, in yeah, both yeah, movies, yeah. he just, he owns it. And it's not, it's not just the dumb shoot him up movie. There's actual, there, there's actual acting into the role. And, and, and I love it. I love both movies. I've watched both of them multiple times. Yeah. And Keanu Reeves is not, you know, he's not going to win an Oscar for best actor. Right. You know, he, you know, he's not Denzel Washington or, you know, anyone of that caliber. However, he does have some acting. Ch- he's not just like, you know, rent, rent a background actor kind of guy, you know, mm-hmm. um, he's just, he hits that, that niche that he was absolutely perfect for the role of John Wick. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. He was. Th- this is like one of those roles that they probably offered to Will Smith and he turned down. Oh no, that was the Matrix. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, yeah, that's uh that's that's just that's just how that works. Um I have been trying to get my son into some logic problems lately. And I have found out that he's really good at math and he's he's really good at information that's displayed right in front of him, but he's not so good at deduction. He can solve a Sudoku like nobody's business, but he can't figure out whose hat was yellow. Um, uh, if you understand that reference. And um, oh yeah, yep. so that, that's one of the things that we're, we're going to try to work on. But um, there's a, there's Brian, you had some things going on with your coworkers that kind of surprised you a little bit. Okay. Yeah. No, as a kid, I did a lot of those logic problems, but yeah, uh, one of the things I do at work is uh, I set up mobile device management, uh, and one of the tools we use called Avalanche uh, heavily uses Boolean logic and a thing it calls selection criteria. So when you're setting up the configurations, you have to tell it which things to apply that configuration to, and so you you know you include groups or individual things, and you put them, string them together, and the thing that says if this is equal to this, and this is equal to this, or this is equal to that. And you just string all that together. Mm-hmm. Uh, it'll select a you know a subset of the devices you have on there uh, to apply the configuration to. And uh, he couldn't do some service for one of our customers this week, and so I ended up filling in for for that. And when I went to look at the previous work he had done, uh, I had found there were bits where he had include this group, and then later on he said, or don't include a group of items that weren't in the groups he'd included. And I was like, I was like, no, that's not how you do that. You include a big group and then you exclude the little group. You don't, or, or, you know, it's like a Venn diagram, but he had two circles that didn't overlap. And he said, use these and don't use these. And I'm like, well, these aren't in there. So you don't need to say to not use them because it's not going to use them anyways. And then when he did it, because of how he did the ands and ors, uh, 
he actually included the he ended up including stuff that was in the not group or you know <laughs> he said not use these but he put an or in where he should have put an and in and it ended up including a bunch of things that weren't in either circle <laughs> This is one of those things. Uh, so we, you and I went through basically the same tech school uh, into the Air Force. And we had, there was a block, like a two-day block on logic problems, on the, the mm -hmm. symbols used and everything else. And solving yeah, the, the these. the ands and ors and yeah. knots. And, and, and yep. they, they'd give you this this huge, I don't want to say huge, but to my 18-year-old mind, it was huge. Uh, this big chart. And you had to follow through, given the criteria that they give you on what the result would be after going through these and and or gates and everything and you know nand nor and mm -hmm. all that um i was i think the only person in my class that got it the first time through because it, it just seems like that's one of the things it either clicks with you or you had gotta kind of work on it a little bit and one girl never got it she totally did not understand but why can't i just do both and you know it was like one of those deals and i was just like geez man um I can understand the difficulties with, with the booleans, uh, but yeah. at the same time, it's, it's just, it's an acquired skill if you're, if you're not naturally into it. So was that the, yeah. was that the block, uh, about the and gates or gates and or gates? Yes. <clears throat> yes. And then, yeah. and then not yeah. gates and all that, and then which the, is interesting because when I got to that class, uh, I was 21 and I'd already gone to, uh, Colorado school of mines, uh, for like a year and a half. Uh, and I had already done some programming stuff in high school and stuff like that. So I already knew ands and ors and nots. And so mm -hmm. when I got to that, I was just like, oh, yeah, here we go. Done. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, it, this is one of those things that is just, like I said, if you, either you clearly understand it or you just got, you just got to work on it. Um, yeah. I was already writing like macros and stuff like that for Excel. And that's where I really got familiar with a lot of that stuff. So. The one thing that I understand, if you want to be included and not excluded, you should go over to patreon.com <laughs> slash ritual misery, uh, become one of our patrons, give as little as a buck, uh, show us that you give a fuck, and uh, we will do our very best to provide extra value to you guys. We absolutely appreciate all of our patrons, whether you're given a buck or five bucks or 10 bucks or whatever it is, uh, you guys are all awesome. You are paving the way for us to make a appearance at South by Southwest. Uh, you're helping us buy much needed equipment upgrades for the show. Uh, you guys are awesome and we, we cannot thank you enough. Uh, so look for some, some really cool stuff coming to patreon.com slash ritual misery. Uh, if you're not already a patron, head on over there and check us out. Um, Kent, there's uh, two things I want to say real quick. Mm -hmm. Number one, we went from logic gates to transistors and I understand logic gates and I still don't can't comprehend how fucking transistors work. They are completely be electricity is completely beyond the scope of my mind because it doesn't follow the rules that my mind has set for it. Um, and two, we finally have our extra life group set up, ready to go, ready for people to join. And we've actually already gotten, uh, uh, Brad LeClerc has already gotten a $25 donation to start everything off, and we are looking for a goal of $10,000 for the year for Diamond Club. So if you are a Diamond Club and you want to help out, if you put something out there, if you have a stream or whatever else and you want to put it out there, uh, I'm going to throw the address here, and, of course, it will be in the show notes, and you can cruise on over by there and uh, join the team or just go to the General Ritual Misery uh, team. We, we're trying to raise $1,000 ourselves, just just us. Uh, we want to get ten thousand dollars for the year, so the Diamond Club can actually say that you know what, fuck you, world. We put forth and made it a better place. <sighs> yeah, that is absolutely awesome. So this is kind of the an, an extension of the uh, Diamond Club Streamathon idea that was that we started what three years ago? Yeah, now? something like that. Yep. Um, where we once a year raised money for a cause. Uh, we're extending that into a year long process that culminates with the new year's eve streamathon mm -hmm. um yeah man this is go this is something that is, is gaining momentum and we are going to continue to promote it and get it into the minds and the eyeballs of all of diamond club so so everyone can participate um yeah much much more to come on this uh what is the what, what is the the team name uh team name is diamond club diamond club all right, so it's head just, over to Extra Life. Just that simple. Join the Diamond Club 
team on Extra Life and and help us reach that goal. Ten thousand dollars for twenty eighteen. It's gonna be amazing if we get even close to our goal. It's just that's just stupid, ridiculous, and awesome. So uh, expect heavy promotion from that. And uh, if you would like to promote that on your podcast, we have special things for you. So let us know. But yeah, um, once you've uh, given a fuck and given us a buck, stop on by that and uh, kick whatever other pennies you have around to make uh, life better for some kids. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Amos, our our guest is a fellow airman in mm-hmm. in our United States mm-hmm. Air Force. Mm-hmm. Um, before I get into asking him some some broad questions about his career. Um, I've got a few specific uh, words that I want to throw at him. Uh, what do you oh. say we move on to, to that? You've got 60 seconds. Get your mind right. It's time for Hot Takes on the Ritual Misery podcast. All right, Brian. The way that this game works is that I am going to throw a topic at you, and you are going to give us your hot take. So whether that's three words, 10 words, 100 words, if you can cram them in there, you're going to talk until you hear that record scratch sound. And you're going to stop and get your next topic. The whole thing's going to last about a minute. You ready? Uh, okay. All right, Brian. Avionics troops, am I right? <laughs> uh, Swaptronics. Swaptronics. <laughs> Weapons troops, am I right? Uh, actually I worked at Edwards and so, uh, they worked with a lot of inert bombs. That was great. <laughs> Concrete droppers. <laughs> Pilots. Am I right? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's not working. Cause you didn't flip the switch that does that. <laughs> <laughs> Nodders. Am I right? I, the, the, the what? <laughs> Nodders. Fucking nonners. Huh. That's that's a new one on me. I haven't heard of that one. Oh, oh shit. We'll get to that in a second. Okay. And finally, <laughs> the Ritual Misery podcast. Am I right? Oh, yeah. It's, uh, it's a great podcast. Very enjoyable. <laughs> the, the, awesome. The, that was the, hot takes. The, uh, the, the energy in his voice when he said how enjoyable this podcast is. Uh, I'm, <laughs> that's, that's the general enthusiasm that we get from everyone. We so should that, clip yeah. that out and just make that a radio <laughs> ad because uh, holy cow. Yeah, that should be our, um, our patron. Uh, uh, you know, hey, everybody, follow us. Look at this glowing endorsement. <laughs> so, so maybe we should ask this. When did you exit your active duty service in the Air Force? Uh, 2003. 2003. Yeah. Okay, so it was a minute or two ago. And, and, and how, how long did you serve? Four years. Four years, okay. Um, so I have to, I, hmm. and you were at Edwards this, the whole time? Uh, yeah, except for the six weeks, at, or six months at, uh, well, it, six Shepherd. weeks at Lackland, and then the, what does that come out to, five and a half months at Shepherd? Something like that, 17, something like that. 17 and a half weeks or whatever, plus or minus. Yeah, whatever that total, it's, it's about six months, yeah. you know, with the basic and the and the other training. Then, well, the, yeah, they sent me off to Edwards for the rest of that. So that explains why you don't know what nonners are. Uh, it could be, yeah. Uh, yeah, so a nonner is a non-sorty producer. So pretty much uh, anyone that's not pretty a, much every- not an operator or a flight line maintainer. So your finance troops, your uh, personnelists, oh, uh, people gotcha. like that, people that piss off a maintainer because they only work day shift. They take an hour and a half lunch where they close the office. Uh, and they're, they're, they take day, training days where they don't serve people. And yep. if there, it's the third Thursday. We can't see anybody today. We're training. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, we had less of that because uh, being a test base, uh, a significant portion of our schedule is geared around the civilian engineers doing mm-hmm. the actual engineering. Uh, and so most of the stuff happened the day. We still had a lot of uh, swing shift uh, work because we had to get the planes working before the next day, but we didn't really have to do a lot. of. Uh, and so for most of the time I was there, we didn't even have a mid shift uh, until 9-11 happened. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, that <laughs> that changed everything. And so, uh, so that was an interesting day because uh, I got woken up with a re- you know phone tree recall uh, and told that, oh, you, you got to wait. We're going to have you come in at your normal time. And then they woke me up again to tell me, oh, now you're on mid shift. 
So they yeah, spent all day shit. waking me up, telling me you need to sleep longer. <clears throat> uh, yeah. yeah, that's that's. Uh, I mean, it's better than than telling you like calling you and telling you, "Hey, it's time to leave the bar. You got mid shift tonight." Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, no, I I totally get what you're saying about the the civilian engineers. I was my my yep. first duty station was Eglin, and okay. it's kind of like Edward's yep. sister base. It, yeah, it's the other it's the other half. It's where it's where you actually test the weapons. Yeah, the things we refuse to do at Edwards. It's Edwards East. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Edwards is more of like the avionics test bed, where Eglin is more of the weapons test bed. Mm. Yep, yep. It's because they like blowing up the water. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Eglin owns more range space than I think any other like property in the military. So everybody, everybody's talking about like, you know, Utah proving ground and stuff like that. But if you include all of Eglin's land assets and water assets, Eglin owns by far the biggest range. Yeah. We used to fly our, uh, our buffs out to Eglin for uh, drills for coastal drills and stuff like that. From, yeah. From, uh, from Louisiana. Yeah, so Amos and Brian are both what's called E and E troops, mm, spark chasers, um, spark chasers. Uh, yeah, you you can't you can't spell geek without two e's. Yeah, that that's true. Damn. Yeah, 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 yeah. So electrical environmental troops. So if if your oxygen ain't flowing right, or if a wire is um, popping off the wrong way, or whatever, you you tend to call E and E. They're basically just like the the extra guy in the spec truck. Uh, so this is how I like to say it. Our our entire career field. Um, and I, well, I was saying this before the the stealths came along and, and proved me right. Um, our entire career field can be soaked up by the box swappers and the crew chiefs, because everything we do is either wrapped up in crew chief sh- like crew chief smut, or we're <laughs> swapping boxes and we got to move avionics bullshit out of our way to get to our boxes to swap. So <laughs> it's uh, uh, and then the stealths the, come along and they don't have a career field. So proof. Yeah. Uh, the the other thing I found is is we were the ones who had to know how the whole plane worked, so we could tell the other people why it wasn't our stuff that was broken. No shit. <laughs> no <laughs> shit. Um, and, and yeah. we we are also the uh the the quality assurance for uh meters for weapons troops because somewhere along the line weapons troops forget how to use a multimeter. And call us out there <laughs> to find the voltages of their shit. Just and they're listen for the beep, right? Yeah, yeah that's you, how you, you use a multimeter. You've got four hundred and eighty three uh, wires right here, and you need me to check voltage on all of them? No, 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 no. Show me that six twenty three you got right there. Oh, that's right. It's right there. Use a multimeter. You signed off. Okay, bye bye. <laughs> yeah, multimeter. All you gotta do is listen for the beep. Yeah, yeah. Beep. Just Good, right? Yeah, you just just put on the on that setting, listen for the beeps, and if you get beeps or if you feel tingles in your fingers, you're good. <laughs> yeah so for the record i was a weapons troop <laughs> <laughs> which is which is one of the reasons it's so easy to pick on them uh, <laughs> uh load, oh, toads. Man. load toads are always fun yeah uh, man I, as much as i'm glad i'm not active active duty anymore every now and then i get very reminiscent of, of the old days of, of loading or uh you know troubleshooting a a uh, weapon system problem or something like that or or uh, l- loading a gun or or whatnot like it is really cool i worked on a i was lucky enough to work on a variety of different airframes um brian you worked on on f-15s right uh yeah i, I worked on f-15s uh the, just to note though the afsc is for all airframes it's not specific to a oh, particular plane right. so i only worked on f-15s because that's where they put me Oh, oh, right. Oh, yeah, that, that was a scene with me as a as a weapons troop. We're shredded until we make our five level, and then we're then we're just wide open. We can yeah. work on it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I I've worked uh, F-15s, F-16s, A-10s, C-130s, C-130, uh, 135, or KC-135s, KC-10s. Um, uh, oh shit! L-100, 747s. What the one, fuck is an L100? Uh, it's an extended 130. Uh, it's a civilian version of extended 130. Um, uh, 141s, which we no longer have in there in service. Uh, uh, Hueys, HH60s, 63s, and 68s. Uh, A10s. I don't think I'm, I don't know if I mentioned A10s. So I've worked like I think it's a total of 17 airframes, 
Um, okay. Yeah. And so if you ask well, me, like, hey, what's the what's the voltage supposed to be on blah blah blah? I'm be like. <laughs> That's what the voltage is supposed to be. Like, find it in the TO because I don't know. Yeah, that's what the, that's what the TOs are for. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think, <laughs> yeah. Well, Amos, I think a lot of your experience came from, or at least the the variety of airframes that you worked, I think came from you working transient. Well, so based. the all the heavies came from me working transient on the flight line, but then most of the others, like uh, my F fifteen work, came as backshop when I was deployed. So mm. when you're deployed as as backshop E and E, you work whatever. Look, if it's got if it's got wires and it came off an airplane, it's coming through you. So we got to work a lot of different things that way. And then of course when I went to Okinawa, Japan, I was working the transit. So that's when I got to work, you know, all the all the heavy jets and that was actual flight line work. And that's when I realized how much I hated my job. Um because <laughs> there, there's there's nothing less satisfying than spending thirty six hours over three days getting a C one C five in the air for it to fly and not come back for eight to ten months. Yeah. Like you, there's no job satisfaction in that. Like, what are you going to do? Look it up. Oh, it landed good. <laughs> no, there's something okay. different when, when an aircraft lands and you're like, yeah, I fixed that shit. Um, and that yeah. satisfaction went there. And that's when I fell, fell out of love with my AFSC and decided that uh, yeah. I didn't really care for most maintenance world after that. Yeah. Uh, speaking of C5s, when I was at Edwards, uh, we had one land there that was going to uh, LA Air Base. Uh, it landed at Edwards because the nose gear didn't come down. Mm. And uh, so they got that nice dry lake bed, which is sort of like a runway, but a little softer. <laughs> uh, and so they they landed it there. Uh, if you look hard enough on the internet, you can find some uh, some KC KTLA footage of mm. that thing landing with the no nose gear. Uh, yeah. They flew it back out. I think two weeks later. Yeah. Um, wow. Yeah. That's one thing about Edwards is anything that came in, it eventually found its way back out. <laughs> Um, uh, except the except the YF twenty three. Well, that was, uh, yeah, that was that was <laughs> well, Dune. That was Dune because it was Lockheed's turn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that was that was the competitor for the F twenty two, right? Yeah. For the yes. for like the uh, first fifth gen fighter. Yep. Interestingly, it was parked right across the taxiway from where I worked for most for for three of those years. Yeah, um, uh, and there was a couple of points where we pulled parts off of it to fix our F 15s because it used. A lot of F-15 parts. Which was one of the reasons that it supposedly, um, as far as the rumor mill goes, did get the contract because it wouldn't have generated as much work because it did reuse a lot of the old parts. Yeah, so, I, heard, I heard the they went with Lockheed Martin because Lockheed Martin had figured out how to contract uh, its manufacturing in as many states as possible. Mm. So Wow. So, Brian, did you work F-15Cs or Es? All of them. Gotcha. Okay. So for people that don't realize, like they are different airframes. Uh, they they yeah. look similar, uh, but they, yeah, so, they operate at least from a, at least from a weapons and, troops perspective, they are very different animals. They actually have a different, uh, different mission. Yes. And, uh, and, and to clarify by all of them, I mean, A's, B's, C's, D's, and E's. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, so there were, there were some that they used for chase planes that were older than I was. Uh, if you ever see pictures yeah. of the nice white and orange planes. Mm. Yeah. They, we had some that were built in 76 that we were still flying around and they were so old, uh, that the TOs didn't cover them anymore. Yeah. We, at Eglin, we were the same. We had, we had all models of F 15s and like every single block of F 16s. And yeah, we, we had jets that were so old. We so we had the TO that was closest to it, but then we also had like an index file with like uh -huh. actual index cards <laughs> with with faults in them that you just had to like look up because yeah. they didn't exist in the TOs anymore. Well, um, yeah, well, this this was interesting because there was at a certain point there was a modification and all the TOs were updated for the modification and supposedly all of the planes had that modification. These ones didn't because they were essentially owned by SI, which is special instrumentation. And they just, they didn't do that update on these ones. And so there was a point where I was maintaining one of those and I uh, got to point to and I'm like, hmm. that's not here. <laughs> uh, the, yeah, it was just, it was well, just crazy. I, I ran into that a lot when the, uh, when the 141s were phasing out, when the, we were going off active duty and going only reserve, I think. And, a lot of our TO changes would come through and the aircraft weren't, weren't getting updated because we were handling all the aircraft regardless of, of what, you know, reserve guard active duty did matter. And the reserves weren't getting the parts and the, the TOs updated as fast as we were. So we'd have 
planes coming through that weren't modified, but of course all of our TOs had been updated, so we didn't have the old information anymore. So we'd have to call back to the base to get copies of their TOs, take it to our QA to get it certified for us to use, and then destroy it as soon as we were done with the job. And yeah. like that whole transition, that the, they kept the 141 around a long, long longer than they should have. Yeah, the, the other fun thing was is because it was a test base and we did have a lot of uh, special instrumentation for certain things. The chase planes had extra cameras and stuff. Like literally where the uh, ammo for the Gatling gun would normally go uh, was just loaded with recording equipment. Mm. There, you couldn't yep. put ammo in there. In fact, on some of them, they pulled the barrels out of it too. Uh, and so there was one point where I was troubleshooting something and it turns out that the SI people had uh, wired one of the flaps uh, wires to ground on one of the test plugs. <laughs> it was just like pilots, like uh, the flaps kept popping and, and flaps being one of the flight critical things. They put the circuit breakers directly in front of the pilot mm. so that if they need to, they can just hold that thing in while they land, which is basically what he was doing. And he's like, with well, flaps kept popping and we're like, uh, troubleshot it, found an orange wire it connected to a place. It really shouldn't have been. <laughs> I remember yeah, working, it, uh, working some circuit breaker panels on the from the 15s were pulling off the line going when I was in Saudi Arabia. And every time they'd bring the panels back, they'd be like, yeah, we need to replace this circuit breaker and this circuit breaker. And I'd flip it over and it just had foam everywhere. Like this, <laughs> this, uh, this anti-fire foam was just, oh my. And chiseling that shit out of like the little nooks and crannies <laughs> and shit. Oh, I was so pissed. Was, it turned like, this, this would be like a 15, maybe 20 minute circuit breaker replacement. And it would turn into like a four or five hour job because of all the foam mm. you had to cut through without, because the foam would be just everywhere. So you had to cut through the phone to make sure you weren't cutting through wires, which just added so much more difficulty to it. And then a, a buddy of mine came over and he had this solution as alcohol and something else. And he would just drop that on the foam and the foam would just kind of like start melting. Ooh. And then he would just, kinda, oh, he would just kind of swipe it away. And then after we get done with the job, he's like, yeah, that stuff's really good. You know, here's a bottle of it. Uh, just make sure it doesn't get on any of the wires. Cause it'll eat away at the, at the shielding <laughs> too. And I was like, what the fuck are you doing to me right now? <laughs> Yeah, that I don't think that's in the TO. <laughs> but it worked. Yeah, the, it worked like great. <laughs> the the yeah, other so, fun one was the uh, relay panels that are up in front of where the pilot's feet go. Mm. Uh, just trying to get those relays in and out of there. It was just one one hand way over your head mm. while your while your head is where the pilot's crotch would normally be, or down yeah. where his, you know his knee would be, and your arms just up there reaching around, and you can't yeah. you can't look at what you're doing or anything. Uh, and changing the relays out is hard enough because uh, they got the little pins on there, and if you put them in crooked, they'll they'll bend and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, but one time I had to replace the whole relay panel, so I'm sitting there trying to put bolts in over my head. It's just ah. Um, that's everything on the F-16. Yeah I, was, yeah. I was about to say the F-16, the, uh, command pot, the command potentiometer that tells the aircraft where the pedals are for nose of steering and for yaw control. Oh, oh is yeah. Mounted that's way right. up in the nose. And the only way to get through it is through the, the, the foot wells and you need the tallest guy in shift to get to it. And of course that was me. And you gotta, you gotta put the seat all the way down and you crawl in there and your head goes in one leg hole. Your arm goes in the other. And then you basically just feel your way around. And that's, that's like a 10 minute job that takes two or three hours. If you don't drop anything, you know, yeah. and it's like you, you basically chew some, some bubble gum and just put that all over your hand and stick your hand back there. Cause if anything falls that we can slap your hand around and catch it. Oh yeah. This, yeah. Little although, things like although, that are just so stupid. Although you did just remind me that the F 16s are fly by wire with yeah. a single engine and mm. a, Basically a single yep. generator. Maybe it has two generators. Uh, really it's, well, it's got two. three. It's got an emergency generator, well, a the, secondary generator, I'm not generator, counting the emergency generator. one, yeah. uh, which is why we call them lawn darts. Yes. Because if you lost your engine, <laughs> uh, you might as well just jump out. Yeah, the first, yeah, it doesn't glide very well. The first time I ever touched F-16 on the flight line, it crashed the next day. Um, yeah. Holy crap. Yeah. So me, me, Meanwhile, the F-15, there are stories of one landing with its entire wing shot off. Yeah, well, the A-10s are the same way. A-10s are, are yeah. uh, I had one come in that got a bird strike on the side where it had damage that took out the engine on that side. So it was basically had one one good side and one side that was the wing, <laughs> aileron, everything, and engine were all just oh, completely wow. shot, either battle damaged or or fought it from these birds. And they oh. went ahead and flew it, and then this lady landed it, uh, and it got repaired there at Shaw, and then flew back yeah. up like a year later or whatever. Um, like, like it, it just 
lighted on its own. I don't, I don't even know how that shit works, but it was amazing. Oh yeah. A A10s are the, the most geniusly built airplanes. A10s are the opposite of F16s. Yep. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, F-16s are actually, they're, they're a great aircraft. Like, they are built all fucked up. They're not maintenance-friendly. They're, you know, there's a scary factor to it only having one engine. There's there's a lot of, like, not in the cool column, I guess. But overall, like, this is one of the most successful airplanes that we've got. And it's mm. it's uh, actually incredibly it's, it's capable. One, it, it's one of the most inexpensive ones is why. And that too, yeah. Well, yeah, and it, I think was, a lot of that has made... to do with the fact that it doesn't have Two engines. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so I'd, I've been lucky to go through my career. To, you know, like I said, when I was at Eglin, every available model of F-15s to include the Strike Eagles, uh, yeah. all blocks of F-16s, um, uh, A-10s, uh, MQ-1s. Um, I, I never worked bombers, uh, but pretty much every fighter I've worked on, uh, well, up until... F-22s came out. Like, I haven't worked on any of the fifth gen stuff, but like pretty much every fourth gen fighter that was out there, um, I've had an opportunity to work on. To include, when I was at Eglin, we had versions that didn't exist anywhere else, just like what you were talking about at Edwards, where, you know, you'd have a, a test platform. So, like, tail number, you know, four, six, seven, or whatever is absolutely unique. Mm. It's not mm -hmm. like any other aircraft in the fleet. And I did want to point something out that you'd mentioned orange wires earlier. And I wanted to yeah. tell everybody what, what significance that had. Anything that's orange on an aircraft means pretty much means that it's unique. It's a, it's a test item. So if you ever see an orange wire, an orange pylon, an orange panel, uh, an orange box, whatever it is, it means that it's something that's being tested. It's not standard equipment on, on that airplane it means and, don't bother having your run a mill three level go out there and work on any of it yeah exactly you know, <laughs> take a three level with you which is like the the apprentice yeah take yeah. your apprentice Flashlight with holder. take your three level with you so that he can hopefully learn something uh but don't send him out there on the job like oh uh hey Emerson yeah. snuffy go fix that mm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> mm. but yeah there were there were airplanes at eglin that pretty much half of the airplane was orange yeah yeah um was that yeah we uh, we we had one that was originally used because when they designed the F-15E, um, it's designed to carry a lot more uh, ar armaments on it, yeah. uh, which is and so. But they which meant they needed bigger engines, and so one of the planes we had was actually used to test the bigger engines, and <laughs> uh, it was a single seater. Uh, and they the F-15Es have conformal fuel tanks to get more fuel to the bigger engines. The plane they put it on didn't have the conformal fuel tanks. <laughs> and so they put these really big, powerful engines on this plane that didn't weigh nearly as much as the one the engines were going to go on. Uh, there may have been a point where the pilot melted the windshield. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. Because he See, was flying too fast. Yeah, that's 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 just that's just, just wrong. Um, yeah. Hey, uh, real quick, uh, before we shut things down tonight, I, I have two questions for uh, for Brian. Okay. One, what got you into Diamond Club? Like, what what found you here? <laughs> so I used to watch Dignation. Oh, okay. And there's a particular episode of Dignation where they're at South by Southwest, mm -hmm. and they had uh, an opening act mm. Mm. that was Brian Brushwood doing basically his his stage show, and that was on the Dignation thing. So and I'm like. That was the year that I met Richard Gunther at South by. Uh, we went to the dig party. Uh, we closed out the dig party and then went to Coyote Ugly and a few other places after. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, after seeing him, I was like, oh, that's interesting. And I started looking. And I found more of them. And then, uh, and then all of a sudden I stumbled upon NSFW, which was what he was doing at the time. And it was just it was hilarious. And so I had to keep watching it. And then I had to go find all the old episodes and go watch all those. I never did get to watching all the BB live shows. I don't even know if they're around anywhere. Oh, they, uh, they I, exist out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I did watch a couple of uh, Brian Brushwood on the roads. Mm. Holy crap. Yeah. That's, that's bringing up. Why are you bringing up old shit? <laughs> 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 yeah. Like, man, that's, that's really getting into the history of, of Diamond. that's really like the kind of the origin of diamond club. That's, Genesis. Yeah. Um, fantastic. So my other question is, uh, 
Star Trek or Star Wars? Star Trek. Mm. Mm. Wrong answer. Mm. So, <laughs> no, Star Trek is cool and all, but do you give a shit about <laughs> the new Han Solo movie that's coming out? So, in contrast to what I'm used to with Star Wars, um, that movie actually looks really good uh, based on that trailer. Uh, it, it's, it does a lot of things that they could have been doing with some of the other movies that they, mm. they like engineered all the fun out of the latest movies for star Wars. And that looks like they put some of it back in. I'm mm. interested to see what, like what survived from the original filming when Ron Howard took over. Like that, that is going to be an interesting that thing to, to me find is, out. Like, is like really, like, really interesting. Didn't, so, didn't Ron Howard do like the young Indiana Jones? No, um, the I, the only thing that's coming to my mind immediately that he did for Lucasfilm was uh, Willow. Do you remember the, the okay, movie maybe, Willow? Maybe that's what I was thinking of as Willow. Okay. Yeah, so he directed that movie, which is actually that's one of my all time favorite yeah. movies. I've probably yeah, seen that movie, movie fifty times. I've never finished it. Oh, dude! Oh my god! Like you being the epic fantasy nerd, like this was George Lucas's epic fantasy, I, like you know, dragons and and th this and uh, wizard Willow. Kind of Willow falls in line with um with uh 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 uh, uh shit uh the karate dude uh uh Bruce uh, Mr Miyagi no ah shit um anyway uh John Wayne and um. John Wayne was not a karate dude. No, no, John Wayne. Uh, 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 uh what, what, the, what the fuck is a karate dude's name? Uh, uh, Chuck Norris. No, the anti Chuck Norris. Um, are we talking about Bruce Lee? Bruce Lee. There you go. Why couldn't I come up with Lee? I don't know. Anyway, yeah, I don't um, know, but I would have Bruce, gotten it if you said kung fu, but you said karate, so whatever. Oh, you threw me off. Oh, <laughs> you know what? You know how much of a shit I give about that. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, all that wraps into uh, you know, also, you know how much I give a shit about Westerns. So Bruce Lee, John Wayne and Willow were like the three things that my stepdad watched all the time. Like, Oh, all, shit. all the time, constantly. So I have never had a, uh, I've never finished Willow and I can't stand Bruce, uh, Bruce Lee or John Wayne. Now, Bruce Lee, I've come back on because I respect him as, as a martial artist, but I still won't watch his movies. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Interesting. That's a. Yeah. Okay. That's actually something from the the history of Amos that I did not know. Yeah. So Willow falls in that category, which is why I've never watched it. Interesting. I I suggest going going back and watching it. Mm -hmm. uh, Brian, what do you think? Did you like Willow? Oh yeah, it's a great movie. Uh, it's, yeah, it's one of the good ones. I, I wanted to be Mad Mardigan. <laughs> Yeah, I had something for for Joanne Whaley. Like she was uh, Princess Sorsha. Oh my god! Like I was in love with Princess Sorsha. I wanted her <laughs> to be mine. Like I wanted to. I wanted to hit her with the um. Was it the 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 fairy dust or whatever the dust of broken hearts? Mm. Oh <laughs> yeah. Like when I was like ten years old or twelve years old or what? However old I was when that movie came out. Like I oh I was like oh my god. Like I want to be Mad Mardigan right now. <laughs> I I thought you had said Jill Whaley, and I was like yeah I remember that. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's another story <laughs> from the history of RMP. I guess. Welcome to welcome to high school. Um, <laughs> hey, uh, uh, Kent, where can people get a hold of you, man? Because uh, I, I, Brian's got a little bit of a, an interesting story about his contact, and I, 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 I love it. So, so Kent, where can people get a hold of you if they'd like to find out more about uh, high school crushes? Yeah, I'm RM underscore Del Noche on Twitter. Uh, if you're on any other platform, look up Del Noche or maybe even Del Noche 77. You're going to find me. Uh, I encourage people, if you're if you're into beer like I am, get on Untapped. I'm Del Noche there. Yep. Um, that's that's really that's that's it, man. What about you? Um, Ethan King. Because it makes sense. Because it makes all the sense in the world. All the sense uh, in the world. E-T-H-A-N-C-A-I-N-E. Uh, Brian, uh, uh, you, uh, so... You're on Twitter. Technically, yes. <laughs> uh, and and what would your Twitter handle be? It is at DF4728A122D9462. Hmm. 
um, yeah, everybody's going to remember that. And uh, just be sure to follow Brian there. Uh, that, in, yeah. in the case you missed that, that is at Delta Foxtrot 4728 Alpha 122 Delta Niner 462. Uh, be sure to give him a, a, a like and uh, maybe even a subscribe. I don't uh, with a name like that. I'm sure you got more than just likes on your page. Uh, wh- what happened there? What what what, <laughs> what 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 the fuck, man? So uh, like Facebook, Twitter is one of those platforms I get on because very specific people are on there and they get specific information. In this case, again, it's the tap room, uh, Plank Road Tap Room over here in Elgin, Illinois. Uh, that insisted on notifying of events spontaneously using Twitter. So I was like, well, now I need a Twitter account also. So I went on there and I started making the account and it gets to the bit where it asks, what do you want your handle to be? And I don't recall exactly the steps I performed, but I didn't fill that out. So it gave me one. (laughs) And because uh, my goal in using Twitter was not to put any sort of content out there or have anybody really follow me or anything. I just kind of left it. So, yeah, uh, if you do go to the trouble to follow me on it, you'll be uh, greatly disappointed by the lack of anything I rarely, uh, rarely if ever do. On <laughs> so is there, is there anywhere out there that you do post content for people to check out? Uh, so for most of the people who are probably listening or watching this, uh, the diamond club discord is probably going to be the easiest place to find me. That's, that's where uh, I'm chatting, uh, fairly frequently. I do a game night most weekends. I think I'm going to miss this Friday, but, uh, I'm usually doing some game night. Uh, as far as content producing, I'm not outputting a lot of content these days. So there's not much to follow. Uh, so I can plug some other people's content. <laughs> <laughs> ah, Fitz wants you to die. Or, no, uh, I'm sorry. Fitz needs you to die. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. That's a great shirt. This, that's the yep. first, uh, I almost said in the wild that I've seen Fitz's shirt. It was, in, I, I in guess, the, uh, yeah. is Twitch uh, slash Skype in the wild? I I mean, does that count? I don't, yeah, I don't know. Uh, and then sure uh, to go somewhere. To go along with that, uh, I've got a little pin here that says "Don't Die." Uh, uh, that's uh, uh so you got you got a little. Uh, uh, I was gonna say anachronism on your on yourself, but it's more of a paradox, I guess. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, it's great. All right, um, and you can always follow the show if if that suits your fancy for whatever whatever reason you followed the show uh at ritual misery uh, you can go by- another glowing uh, uh, yeah it, it, anyway go ahead sorry sorry hey uh, ahead, sorry. i i i excel at self-deprecation uh you can find uh find our subreddit at uh ritual misery reddit.com all of our shows all the things we post uh all the things we pr- put out there are on there including um let's talk about thrones and uh well film zone if he ever decides to bring that back and everything else we're doing um, and of course you can submit your own ideas there as well. Uh, you can find all these links and more ways to support the show and give feedback at our website, ritualmisery.com. We are live every Thursday at 7 PM Pacific on diamondclub.tv and twitch.com slash ritual misery. Thank you so much to Kevin McLeod for allowing us to use your music. And, uh, thank you for listening for Kent, for me, for Brian and for you. This has been your ritual misery podcast. See ya. Bye. Way early, what the hell? And before we do the Diamond Club stinger, Jackie Hearn, Deuce Gone Wild... M beam and deuce gone wild again. Thank you so much for your subs, your bits and your pledges on Patreon. Thank you so, so much. Hell yeah. Thanks guys. Diamond club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> and I still got to catch you off. <laughs> yes. Oh God. Anyway, what I was going to say is you guys are awesome. Thank you. <laughs>